we're back at one of the best in the business. On this special episode, we don't have to go too far away from home to see the wilds of North America. In 1984, and for decades to come, they brought the continent's exotics from the mountains, prairies, and wetlands together in a 13-acre preserve. Some animals, whether they be big or they be small, that might wander around your backyard. Though people may grow tired of seeing them, that still doesn't mean they shouldn't be celebrated with some attention. Before the new Adventure Cove, the North America attraction was always the first to get noticed. And before the sea lions came along to take the crown, the zoo's opening animals were trumpeter swans, a beautiful monogamous waterfowl that had to be rescued from the brink of extinction after being hunted heavily for their meat, feathers, and skin. By the 1930s, it was thought only 60 or so remained until several thousand were discovered in Alaska, many of which were relocated to the Swan's former territory. The National Park Service estimates that there are now 60,000 in North America and are listed by the IUCN as least concern. Now if only our next animal had as good of a comeback story as that one. Introducing the first tour with Mexican Wolves one of America's most endangered and therefore one of its rarest animals, which seems to be a theme anytime I feature a canine. Their story is similar to the red wolf. At least 4,000 Mexican wolves lived in America's southwest and of course throughout most of Mexico, which isn't a bad number for a subspecies. But by the mid-1900s, they were disturbingly close to being exterminated thanks to hunting, trapping, and even poisoning because they're considered a nuisance to livestock farmers. In the mid-70s, the U.S. and Mexican governments collaborated to capture all remaining Mexican gray wolves in the wild, which could be counted on two hands. A captive breeding program was then initiated, and eventually many were released back into protected areas so they can hopefully recolonize in their historic range. And you will have to wait to catch up on that program's progress, because I'll bring it up on another upcoming episode. So next would be the big guys, but I've saved them for later. Nearby is the Habitat Hollow, otherwise known as the park's children's zoo. There's a coop for chickens, a guest accessible barn, and of course a large petting zoo for domestic hoofstock like the Jacob's sheep, Nigerian dwarf goats, and Gora goats, and black belly sheep. And if you're lucky, you may catch a glimpse of their miniature Dexter cattle. Now way far ahead is another family-friendly exhibit and rodent that might even put a smile on the parents' faces. The black-tailed prairie dog, the meerkats of America's Great Plains. These dogs are actually a kind of ground squirrel and are only named after their alarming barks. They prefer flat open fields with soil that works best for digging complex burrows under the surface, which they can do here. What they can't do, however, is build one that could fit hundreds of millions of prairie dogs like some do in the wild. They are this North America's smallest mammal, and their exhibit is placed in front of its biggest. You can also learn about their underground lifestyles, and you can sort of experience it for yourself. Not far ahead is another fantastic habitat, a sanctuary once home to timber wolves, but you'd see a Canada lynx. This is all I got of her, so I'll be moving on to something that's off the main path and easy to miss if you don't pay attention. A boardwalk takes you briefly into the woods and across the pond is the channel's very first Alaskan moose at around 10 feet long. 1,200 pounds and sporting an impressive six-foot span of antlers. They are the world's largest deer. Their broad muzzle and flexible lips helps them strip leaves from branches and to grasp aquatic plants, which is why they live near swamps and they are excellent swimmers. So yes, they can access this pond. Back on the main path, there's a display that did actually have a moose, but today shows a couple that I guess is a little different from a big deer. Sand Hill Cranes, one of the hemisphere's most widespread birds, covering the skies in the hundreds of thousands from Alaska all the way to Mexico, especially during migration. But not this kind, because the Florida subspecies doesn't do much traveling. 
At the halfway mark, front and center, you can circle all around the zoo's reindeer. Or is it caribou? Whatever you call it, you're talking about the same species, but there are still some differences. According to Nat Geo, caribou refers to wild populations in North America, while reindeer refers to those in Europe and those that are domesticated. Other than helping out Santa Claus, they're also famous for taking part in massive migrations. Groups differ in size and distance, but a herd that roams around the Arctic contains 70,000 animals and will migrate between the summer and winter seasons for over 100 miles. At what I call intermission, you can go through the polar frontier for what some consider a once-in-a-lifetime view. Or you can teleport to the Ajabu National Park for one of the world's most convincing man-made savannas at the heart of Africa. But those are for another time. Back in America by the Reindeer is a 1987-built enclosure for an American black bear who I want to say has a cinnamon morph. Out of about 10 visits, this is the most I've ever seen them. I'm guessing they're shy, which would explain these blinds placed over the viewing windows. Adjacent is a replicated exhibit to the last. Once a home to a 40-year-old grizzly bear has since been reworked for river otters, one of the animal kingdom's most playful, even when they're mature. And they get this boundless energy thanks to their fast metabolism rate. Even though their layers of fur and fat slow the process, basically this means they can lose body heat after spending a lot of time in the cold and water. So they have to constantly be moving to gain that comfortable heat back. If you haven't noticed, these two don't have an underwater viewing, and they tend to stay near the center of their environment, which if you ask me is a way better design as it closely reflects how you might watch them in the wild, but it especially helps if you bring along a long-ranged camera. Up next, an animal that rivals the otters in cuteness. Jesse, an elderly mountain lion, enjoys life in a recently upgraded home, which is far more suitable than their old cage and twice the size. You'll notice that she is partially blind, but she still has a very important job. She has to look after her babies. Three playful, curious, and troublesome cubs meet sisters Goldie and Poppy and their brother Captain Cal, who give Kulu, the zoo's baby polar bear, a run for his adorable features. In the wild, they may stay by their mother's side for over two years before going off on their own and practicing what she taught them. Sadly, that won't exactly be the case for these three. Cal and his unrelated siblings were victims of the California wildfires and were found orphaned and rescued by firefighters. They recovered from their injuries at the Oakland Zoo before making their way to Ohio. So no, Jessie isn't actually their mother, but try convincing her that. Mountain lions are more social than originally thought, and when her brother passed away, they wanted to give her the opportunity to bond once more. And it didn't take long at all for her to accept these three as her own. And she has more in common with them than just being a large cat. She's considered a rescue, just like them. And since they draw a huge crowd, it would be a good time to head into the nearby cabin. It's not bad, kinda cozy, comes with a fireplace and a photo of Bigfoot. But the listing failed to mention that it also comes with a Wolverine. Don't let its small size fool you. They are one of the most intelligent, ferocious, and fearless animals on the planet. Hence their other name, the Devil Bear. The name and body shape may indicate they are related to bears, but the Wolverine is actually a member to the weasels. So how tough are they? They've been known to travel over 30 miles just to find a meal, which can include something as small as an egg to something as grand as a caribou, especially if that prey struggles in deep snow since this mustelid is naturally equipped with their own snowshoes. Their jaws and neck muscles allow them to crush frozen meat and bone, and that's not all. When they do bag a kill, or scavenge as they mostly do, they have a reputation for chasing off animals away from their food that are much larger than themselves. As for the zoo, if you see this kind of endurance, you are lucky, because this scene usually looks like this. One last fact, right here is the only time I have ever heard visitors be disappointed in seeing a certain zoo animal, and I'll let you guess why that is for this video's trivia question. 
And now one of my favorites is 1997's Migratory Songbird Aviary, a place for peace, especially if you're lucky enough for it to rain so the ground gets muddy and thus keeps others away. So you can search for over 30 birds yourself. And if you don't spot one right away, these heaters will usually fix that problem. On this side, you might find the American Goldfinch, Song Sparrow, Cedar Waxwing, and the good old-fashioned American Robin. But things are much different on the aviary's other side by the pond. And by that, I mean it's much busier. The forest half is for songbirds, and this is where the waders and waterfowl come to congregate. Look for blue winged teals, buffleheads, hooded mergansers, golden plovers, the ruddy duck, killdeer that are often found on America's coastal beaches. The snow goose seen here in what's called its blue morph. There's a Sora with feet adapted for walking on aquatic plants and sharing that ability is the white-faced ibis, what I like to call the aviary's standout creature. But the water theme doesn't end here. It flows into the wetlands which has the first large flight cage we've seen for the bald eagle. And it's no surprise that these are rescues, but here's how their home differs from others. First of all, they are given the opportunity to fly, even if they're not the best at it. Second, there's multiple nests, which can be 10 by 10 feet wide and deep and weigh up to 2,000 pounds. And in Columbus, they aren't entirely for show. Between 1978 to 2000, the zoo produced 21 eaglets, most of which were released into the wilds of Tennessee, New York, and Ohio, adding to the numbers of this once endangered symbol. And following is a 1994 edition that could be considered our final stop. The right side of this viewing used to be very natural looking tanks home to small fish, but now they're covered up with signs that educate you on the wetlands. The actual exhibit is very open and was designed for otters, but you'd see friendly American beavers, a rodent that prefers to burrow on the water in their virtually impenetrable wooden dens that can only be accessed by swimming underneath it. I know here the glare isn't exactly the best, but it's not every day you can get this close to a beaver. Remember those big guys I mentioned earlier? Well, there's two, one being the pronghorn. America's fastest mammal, often ranked second in the world to the cheetah. We've talked about them before, but we've never really spent a good amount of time getting to know the American bison. They are the biggest terrestrial animal on the continent, packing a modest average weight between one to 2,000 pounds. And that's not just from this dense shaggy fur that helps them battle minus 40 degree temperatures. And despite all this bulk, they can run up to 35 miles per hour. Males use that speed for a head-to-head -head combat to see who gets the girl, and they use those intimidating horns to ward off any threats. If only they worked on us. A few hundred years ago, the fields from Alaska to California to Texas felt the stampedes of 50 million bison. When European settlers came along, they were commercially hunted. By the late 1800s, only 325 bison were left Fortunately, not long after, Yellowstone National Park, native tribes, private breeders, and even zoos helped with the recovery. And with good old-fashioned protection, breeding, and releasing, the numbers went up. Though they don't compare to the past, today there are roughly 500,000 American bison roaming in preserves and parks. 5,000 at Yellowstone and two at the Columbus Zoo that hang out mostly on the left side of their acre and a quarter field, but can be seen across from the wolves, over by Habitat Hollow, behind the prairie dogs, from the pony rides, and of course by the beavers. Some of you may already know this, but in the zoo world, exhibits that focus on local wildlife are often overlooked by enthusiasts and even the average visitor. But I think it's safe to say that this is not the case, nor will it ever be, for the Columbus Zoo's North America. Stay tuned for the next episode, keep those subscribers coming, and thank you for watching.